Yeah, I'm so demanding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... Nice. Oh. Hey. Hello, welcome everybody to another Sonic Talk. This is episode number 312, recording today live on Wednesday the 8th of May. Uh, and uh, we have a very special guest this week uh, in the form of Mr. Carl Hyde. Um, he's been, uh, he's been, what, what would, what would, we haven't quite kidnapped him, but I know he's Ooh. here and available. So uh, I'm going to say hello to you and I'm going to point everybody to carlhyde.com because uh, that seems to be where most of your information seems to Seems to be. Thank you. Seems to live. That's Carl, very nice of you. That's all right. Uh, Carl, of course, um, has got the the new album out, Edgeland, which is a kind of a solo project. I think it would be fair to say. We're going to jump straight in with Carl um, because I know he's got a limited amount of time, but we do have our other guests here. But perhaps what we'll do is we'll just come straight in, and uh, we can have a chat with you first. Thank you. Um, great album. Thanks a lot. And a kind of whole, a whole new direction for you, really. I mean. D- Explain how it came about, if you wouldn't mind, if you've got a sort of potted history. I'm sure you've said this a lot of yeah. times. Yeah, no, it, it largely came about from uh, collaborations with Brian Eno in his Pure Seniors project, where I met Leo Abraham, who was working on that as well. And also out of standing on stage at Sydney Opera House a couple of years ago with Brian and thinking this is where I want Underworld to be, in a seated auditorium where I could communicate on a in a different way to the way that Underworld communicates. And uh, plus the fact that Underworld have always made... Uh, or personal kind of music within their better known dance sound and uh, I wanted to explore that some more and so Leo and I got together and we started to improvise which is the way we'd always work with Brian and out of that came this this album. I, I was listening to the album over the last couple of days I mean it's a very different direction I mean it's there are elements of it you've still got the kind of elements of the the classic underworld anthemic build but without the kind of dance underpin i mean did you find you had to learn a new musical language or did it kind of evolve naturally i mean how how did you approach that it was very natural and quite deliberate that we didn't um, try and emulate underworld i was i was really specific when we got together leo and i to say that i didn't want it to be a, a sub underworld or a division of and i didn't want to try and compete in any way so we had to get rid of beats as much as possible um, and it was it was pretty straightforward, really, because we both came from that Eno school of thinking and improvising and making up the material as we went along. And out of that, then, of course, it sounds as if it was all fully formed. But we, we wrote a lot of material and, and then we culled it afterwards and did a few edits and started to make the shapes after that. Uh, okay, it's interesting because uh, uh, in the the notes there's a great on Spotify there's a great sort of uh, uh, companion to the album which basically is you talking about the individual tracks as you come along and one one yeah, element yeah. that was very interesting to me was the fact that you 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 feel you've always been kind of thought of as somebody who who just cut does cut up and doesn't necessarily kind of come up with fully formed ideas in in traditional sense but actually you were saying that that's not some that's not strictly the case and this was a, a vehicle for you to to kind of prove that to a greater degree is that fair to say it is yeah i've, I've always written uh, roadmaps really i've written journeys and, and collected fragments along the journeys and, and sung those back and it, it, it just so happens that it sounds a bit william burroughs but I've never been a fan, and uh, and that cut-up method has not been something that I've employed. It's just it's just the way that I write. I, I collect fragments. So on this album, I just wanted to make the lyrics more accessible. I wanted to put some clues into there as to what the what I was singing about. It was interesting because you're also talking about the way that dance is a vehicle. It's actually very... Uh, the underpinning of it allows you... Um, not necessarily to, to, to be less expansive so you don't have such a sort of linear form you know you have the evolution of the build and the and the arrangement yeah. is perhaps less complex in some ways whereas this is big, a, a lot more musically kind of evolutionary and in in terms of songs i mean did you find uh, as with lots of albums there's a piece of technology or s- some kinds of technology that enable certain things and become a kind of something that you explore alongside the evolution of a record did you find there was anything going on there was there uh, yeah, Leo who I work with just collects the most 
extraordinary pedals and effects and plugins. And of course, Brian as well will always come up with pointing at things and saying, try this and try that. And, and yeah, there was, there was a lot of processing that went on, particularly in things like creating rhythms and then processing the instruments so that like myself, you know, you often don't really know that he's playing guitar on the album because of the, the, the amount of processing that's gone on. And, um, the other the other aspect of it is obviously uh, at the kind of initial stage because you're working. I mean, I guess it's quite hard for you all to be in the same place at the same time for extended periods of time, particularly with your commitments with Underworld or whatever. Did you find that there were uh, ways that you were developing ideas remotely? What would happen was everything was written together. We said that that's the way we were going to do it. So I think we spent about eight days. Over, over a period of a few months. But then we would start working remotely and sending each other stuff on the internet. Then I really like to take things away and cut them up and try other things where, I don't know, I get embarrassed, really, <laughs> sometimes doing stuff in front of people. And it's just enabled me to, and both of us, really, to try out other ways of looking at the, at the forms and sending them back to each other with a, with a different point of view to perhaps the one that we'd had when we were initially together. Yeah, so I mean, so you find experimentation and the kind of evolution of that process is sort of better spent in your own company. You prefer yeah. to do it that way. Yeah, it, it it is, and then and then we would get together and and then you push yourself beyond that embarrassment. With with Brian, we were doing it live in front of an audience where he was firing the band was firing music at me and I had to imp improvise lyrics and melody in no front pressure, of a live then. audience. Mm, yeah. It was it was it was great. <laughs> you know, was actually, that was the thing that Underworld that used to do a lot of that, and over the years it, it's it's performed less that way. That's less the way that the music and the shows have gone. So it was fantastic to be able to explore that way of working again and, and performing. Um, and I mean, the other thing that was interesting is this kind of thread of the. Uh, the morph between visual ideas into song ideas and just kind of ideas for lyrics. Uh, particularly mm. if you go to your blog at uh, carlhyde.com, let me find that. Uh, that every day you kind of post a new uh, element, an image, and it's got a very strong um, visual element that then translates into the music. I mean, do you find you think very much in those terms? I, I remember things as, as, as pictures, yeah. I. Words are difficult things to remember. Numbers almost impossible, and uh, that's why I, I still carry a lot of notes on stage with me. But uh, pictures, pictures mean a lot to me. I, I'm a art school dropout. You know, actually, I didn't drop out of art school. I dropped out of everything else to go to art school. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's that. That is my background. As a kid, I always was visually orientated. Now, where's he going? <laughs> And and where that we've also got obviously Gaz Williams here who's playing bass in your band. I mean, because that's the other thing. I mean, this is very much a kind of band project. Now it's come out of the studio and mm. making it sort of come alive with a bunch of musicians. I mean, I know in the very early days of Underworld and sort of early guys is you know that was very much the case. But it, has it has it been a rediscovery that process or is it uh, is it like familiar territory? It's lovely. It's great to be to be playing in a in a slightly more traditional group um i say slightly because everyone is is doing things which are which is which are more than they appear to be doing um gaz can talk talk more about that himself but um it has been really nice with underworld we take this huge mixing desk on on the on the road and it's like taking a studio on tour where things things have certain set ways of being it's not like a press and everything will happen but there's a there's a remixing of the, of the tune that runs for a certain length um every night and um with this band it was nice to be able to be more fluid than that yeah and i mean the other thing i i saw you play at brixton academy a couple of years ago um mm. which was absolutely amazing but it f looked like you really carried the you know the the focus of the entire show all the time was all on you at you know, every moment pretty much apart from you know perhaps when you weren't si singing you were still moving around and creating the energy there yeah. have you been able to kind of like take your foot off the gas a bit and kind of enjoy the the performance in a different way when we when we play with underworld it's very physical it's interesting that we were going from a very large auditorium with underworld in mexico and then playing with my own band in a, in a small club here in england and the different dynamics are something that I've craved for a long time because for the last 20 years it's been pedal to the metal. And, uh, and now with Brian, it was, it was delightful to be able to talk, to engage, as I say, in a, in a much, 
in a much more personal way and to uh, exchange thoughts and ideas with the audience um, that, that weren't just you know, hands yeah. in the air, <laughs> like you just don't care. It works, it works, you know, I mean, it, it, the, the energy that you kind of give off of stage is just astonishing. I mean, I can't imagine how you could do more than one night without several days off. I mean, it just must be physically very demanding. I mean, so I guess you've got more time for press on this tour then. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's music. It's the music does it. Interestingly, when we were down in Mexico, I hadn't trained uh, or cycled for a long time. And I just thought, I'm going to be crippled by the time I get off stage. And we were working at altitude and where I always bring oxygen in to a, an event like that and didn't need the oxygen. Just the, the music kicks in, the body was fine and uh, something happens. I guess it's the adrenaline. Yeah, well, it's interesting that the whole cycling at altitude. Uh, and so you, you nip off on the the oxygen tent at the side of the stage. You'll have people telling all sorts of uh, fantastic rumours about you there. That's a great, great rumour mill, that one. <laughs> we had a, we, we last time we played in Mexico, the first time we played in Mexico, we were uh, up a mountain and um, we, uh, we asked for oxygen and an ambulance turned up. <laughs> Lord knows where the casualties were, but the ambulance turned up just for me, which seemed fairly extreme at the time. <laughs> so that's, that's interesting. Uh, when you play at altitude, in terms of kind of the way the PA works and the bass throw and all those sort of things, do, does that change because of the, the density of the air? Yeah, I, th I guess it must do, really. Um, it's something I I never get the joys of hearing that. I always, we've, we've always got in-ears and, uh, and stuff. Uh, to, so that we, we take our own mix. We, we use uh, Function 1s on stage. We've got our own monitor system, you know, subs and, and highs and mids. So we've always carried Function 1s with us for years. So we're, we're kind of a semi-enclosed unit. So whatever's going on out front right. tends not to bo bother us. But, uh, but, um, but um, what tends not to bother us. But um, that night on the mountain in Mexico, it rained in hor uh, horizontally. <laughs> so... As the show was going on, the the, 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 de the mixing desk was going down channel by channel to the point where we barely had enough channels left to finish the tune. It was probably like a bass drum and a kick drum or something. Wow, that's uh, one of those classic, uh, j just get you out of the gig by the skin of your teeth. Um, going back to the album, um, there's some, I mean, to my ears, there's, there's almost some um, English folk undercurrents in there, you know, particularly <laughs> with the with the... Um, with with some of the harmonies and the kind of textures of the backing vocals, uh, yeah. did you did you spend a lot of time um, creating those textures, or were you using you know stuff like uh, TC Electronic that kind of thing? I mean, did, or how yeah. do you use that live? Yeah. Oh, we're not doing a plug here, are we? Uh, yeah, we yeah Leo uh, was using the TC and uh, loved it uh, because we've used really old Roland vocoders for a long time with Underworld, and they're beautiful, but it's the Underworld sound, and I didn't want to rip off the Underworld sound or, or fall back on that, and, uh, and he brought in the voice works, and I loved what it, what it did. It sounded kind of mutant in a way that I remember hearing a uh, theme from A Clockwork Orange and not quite working out how they were doing it, and I, I, I liked that sound, and we used them on stage as well, and, I, and I, they've been interesting, uh, at different times they've performed in their in their own inimitable manner but i think vocoders do that they they sometimes go off their own direction and it's happened with underworld as well yeah uh, well uh, i mean the the roland vocoders yeah have an absolutely specific sound i mean i i'm continually amazed when i hear the uh, voice live technology when they kind of go oh, here's a you know hold on a minute it's analyzing this in real time and correct it's just it's kind of the thing that you expect plugins to do with a bit of time to think about it and that's yeah. the thing so is that happening on your voice live as well because I, I know yeah, some people yeah. use yeah yeah so uh, um a angie pollock who's who's one of the keyboard players in the band she's she's operating all the time an astonishing vocoder player because she tracks me uh when i'm scatting and ad-libbing and sometimes just making up a new and a new way of, of, of singing it, she will follow me. And I st I'm still, to this day, don't know how she does that. Oh, that's astonishing. It's a, it's a yeah. pretty nifty technique, I must admit. And, and so when you are performing live, are you kind of off the grid now? So you can kind of just go where you want? Or is there still a kind of a certain amount of uh, guidance that you, know, you have to follow yeah. to, to a degree? Or? Yeah, there, there is Peter Chilvers, who's the other keyboard player, musical director. He's, he's using laptops with Ableton. So we... we but he's also firing off loops, so we can go off grid if we want to. I think it would be interesting, wouldn't it, Gaz? If we if we did go off 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 grid, uh, 
yeah, we should. We really should go off grid a bit more often. Perhaps when we're at the Sydney Opera House in a few weeks' time, the home of of the great ad lib, we'll, <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go right off piste and and see what happens. And and so you're. How how long does this tour kind of extend for? I mean, because you've done a number of dates and it seems like you're kind of zigzagging the globe quite uh, erratically. Yeah, we're down in um, we're down in Melbourne on the twenty fifth of of May, Sydney Opera House on the twenty seventh. Then we come back to play Sonar in Barcelona, and then we, at the moment, finish off. Uh, although I've I've heard of some more dates, guys. Um, we're finishing off on the uh, at uh, Fuji Rock on the 27th of July, which is extraordinary to be to be back there again with, with this. And, and presumably, a lot of these places are places that you've gone before with Underworld. So, I mean, well, not the Opera House. Not no, the Opera I mean, House, the, right? The Opera Opera House and and, and th- that kind of auditorium has been a dream to take Underworld. So it's it's been uh, a real f- a fast track for us to be with this ensemble uh, playing at the Opera House so soon after being there with Brian. So I'm I'm thrilled. But um, auditoriums of that nature is something I would like to see Underworld performing a different kind of show in. So in, in a lot of ways, especially because this band is also performing its own versions of Underworld tracks, um, this is a, this is a, a, a way, a, a test bed right. for for other ways of performing with underworld as well and finding things out uh, as well as a hell of a lot of fun it sounds like it. i mean uh, i i know the band have a, have a hoot and gaz has been relaying kind of tales and of, of enjoyment yeah. and what have you along the way i'd imagine um for you that 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 first gig you know which uh, when you're kind of out showing effectively bearing your kind of not your soul in a new way to the audience you, that presumably you can say something rude then there's new solar, there's their souls, and there's other souls. Okay. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. How do you? I mean, how was that? Did it kind of like? Uh, did it give you the energy you wanted? You know, back from it, or was it? How do you cope with those sort of nerves? Because I imagine uh, the underworld, you must be used to play massive stuff now. Yeah, I, I, I've never been nervous. So, it, but what it is is it, it's it's a case of trying to remember everything. And because um, that sounds really boastful, doesn't it? I, it just uh, it just happens to be the only place I've ever felt calm is on a stage. Um, but what was what has been interesting is playing guitar and singing again all all at the same time. I've I've, I've played guitar since I was seven, and then around about 1990s stopped playing lots of guitar on stage. I play vocoders off my guitars, but very little live guitar. Um, and now here it is. I'm playing a lot of complex parts that Leo wrote and trying to sing at the same time and remember all the patches and how everything goes and. It's it's more a case of of juggling all of that and trying to get it working in your head in a way that it sounds fluid and it sounds um, it sounds right it sounds yeah. sounds at, at ease you know and uh, we've got there now we've got there thankfully Gaz gives me a lot of cues so uh, yeah I only ac- occasionally crack him in the head with my my <laughs> guitar. So does it mean do you, do you take a, a, you've got quite a collection? I mean, you're uh, I know you've played guitar for a long time, and every time I've seen you with a yeah. guitar, it's been a, a lovely uh, a lovely model. What are you What are you playing live in terms of guitar models and and a bit oh, of tech rig talk? Yeah, no Telecasters. Um, I I think I've got a countdown to me leaving, but um, I've I've got a uh, Telecasters. I've got a fifty two reissue and a seventy reissue, uh, and I'm using a pair of 1970s Fender Bassmaster combos that are somewhere around 12 or 15 watts um, that are, have just been just been reserviced for me, which and sound absolutely beautiful. And then a, a pedal board, which largely I'm 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 going to Joe's Pedals to uh, to get all my pedals. He's absolutely fantastic. If you know that website, an utterly brilliant website, and a guy who always comes back to me with options. So if I'm throwing things at him, there was a um, Gaz will remember the name of it. It's a fantastic orange pedal, very 1970s. The Faust like a, tone. The Faust tone. There you Faust go. Tone. That sounds very, uh, yeah, very. Un- and it's, <laughs> it's one of only. It's, it looks like an old Park uh, fuzz pedal, the kind of fuzz sound that I hated as a kid because it didn't sound like Jimmy Page, but it sounds like Robert Fripp. And uh, so this thing is. I, it turns out it's got this fantastic sound, but it's, uh, it's one of only a hundred that have ah. this, these components. So um, I'm looking after that one. <laughs> That's great. So having a lot of fun. You get to throw some guitar yeah. shapes as well. 
not just yet, actually. <laughs> I haven't quite perfected the shapes, but I'm, I've got the licks down. Right. I, I, I know you've probably got to go, but I yeah. want to say thank you very much for joining us, Carl. Uh, oh, if thanks, you want guys. to uh, see what Carl's up to and check out the tour dates and you know, buy the album, Edgeland, uh, you get it in all good uh, digital outlets and I believe uh, on the high street retail outlets as well. Thanks Carl, a lot. Yeah, yeah, thank you. CarlHyde.com. Thank you very much, Carl. See you guys. Bye, guys. See everyone. Bye. See ya. All right. Coolio, um, that was fantastic, and, and I want to say thank you to Dave Spears for uh, helping get that going. Um, because uh, obviously, um, I'd never have the clout to get him on the show. <laughs> that, that was fluke. That was total fluke. I may as well introduce you, Dave. Dave Spears, yeah, G Four Software. There he is, G Four Software dot com with his massive dot com modular behind yeah, him at the same time. Oh, he's, there you go. Mark, Mark's just intercepted you. Uh, we'll say hello to everybody. So hello, Dave, and uh, thank you for waiting patiently. And also there's um, Mark Tinley, uh, likebeing.com. Thank you very much also for joining us. Hello. How that are you? That was nice, wasn't it? I yeah. really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I'm great. Um, I'm glad I managed to... Um, I was. I had a load of uh, questions that were a bit more philosophical, and I thought I've got to try and steer it to tech. But yeah, interesting, really, really nice, um, nice one to come along. Thank you very much. Yeah, what a we've, lovely guy as well. Yeah, it's only taken what? How long have we been? How long have we been trying to get him on the show? A, a little while, but uh, two years. Two years. Oh, well, that's not too bad. That's all right. <laughs> and we'll also say hello to Mr. Richard Hilton over there in Connecticut, uh, who's also been waiting patiently. How are you, Rich? Good, thank you. Uh, Rich, of course, is. I'll have to speak a bit more because otherwise he's going to remain a small window. <laughs> he who Hi shouts there. loudest. Rich, of course. Studio engineer for Nile Rogers plays on uh, chic, the Chic Travelling Disco uh, tours. And uh, so there he is, Hiltonius.com. And, of course, uh, we also have Gaz Williams, who uh, you probably saw a little bit there. He's playing bass with uh, Carl Hyde at the moment and uh, has got a fabulous new video bandwidth. Let's, hope, let's see you, Gaz. Um, here I am. Ah, there he uh, is, Gaz Williams in yeah. red, Repl <laughs> resplendent in red. So, Gaz, um, thank you again. Uh, thank you for joining us, too. My pleasure, always. So, um, f thanks also to uh, Isotope for sponsoring the show. We have a message from them a little bit later on. I well, I suppose we could do that now because it's halfway through the show, sort of in terms of time. So let's do that, and then we'll come back in with uh, some of the show topics. How does that sound? So I'm going to press that now. So I want to say thank you very much to uh, Isotope for sponsoring the show. And what we've got here is uh, Iris. They have, what, I mean, this is a fabulous synthesizer uh, natural intuitive selection it basically works on the same principle as the rx technology which where you get the spectrogram you can draw shapes you can kind of isolate harmonics up to four partials apply synthesis control to your selections and yeah layers and shape and morph new textures you can sound sculpt enjoy warm lush filters delays reverbs chorus distortions for each layer and there's lots of sound libraries that you can add wood glass toys voice altered and prepared objects as modular synths and the iris expansion packs uh, you could download a free 10-day demo of this fully functional isotope.com forward slash iris safe in the knowledge that also one of our regular guests on the show uh, um, had a great very great deal to do with uh, producing the isotope iris so once again enjoy isotope iris we thank them very much for sponsoring the show oops that's not it 10 day free trial free trial demo isotope.com forward slash iris it's a shame we didn't have more time because originally when carl was starting to write that album I went up to see him and I know that him and Leo were using Iris as a as a kind of way of starting a dialogue, a musical dialogue between the two of them. So they would kind of, you know, draw these things. As soon as I kind of mentioned that I was working on this thing, which was like Photoshop for audio, Carl's uh, ears pricked up immediately. And it was really interesting, actually, because they were using it. And I don't know how much of that's actually translated into I can the hear, I can definitely show. hear some iris tones in there somewhere. Um, there's some sort of slightly, or, or at least granular elements. It's, it sounds like it to me, but I, I, I wouldn't know that and without obviously seeing the multi or whatever. But it sounds like it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, anyway. I yeah, and, I, oh, and, and likewise, I wanted to also talk about the synesthesia, um, which was an interesting subject as well. The, the kind of... The, one sense translating to another, which some people um, get to larger or lesser degrees. I know that uh, some it, of our panel do. Carl, Carl is a synesthetic. How would you mm. say this? A synesthesist. 
a synesthetist. Yes, I, maybe synesthete. It is. A a shame synesthete. It's a shame he's yes. gone actually, because he's got very interesting experiences with that, and it really does translate a lot of his, um, you know, his music and his art is all very kind of, you know, keeps crossing over in his brain. Um, I, yeah, I was I was hoping to get onto that, but uh, I trying to, you know. Limited time, we got as much as we could do. But the, the, the next topic actually uh, will introduce a little bit of that. So I'm going to see if I can get that to play. I'll try that without Gaz Lover laid it. this noise which was a bit disappointing after that beautiful introduction but this is the colour play uh, it's a project by Louise Fu and Natasha Zerny uh, from introduction to physical computing at the interactive telecommunications program at NYU uh, and it's essentially allows you to create um, musical sequences and uh, I guess responses from a sort of colour wheel and I'm pretty sure it was you, uh, Mark, that brought this one up. Um, what was it about the appeal? Because I know that you've we've talked with you about synesthesia. Synesthesia. Synesthesia, synesthesia before. Synesthesia, synesthesia. God, I don't even know how it's pronounced. Um, uh, what was it about it? Well, it's just... Um, I think I saw it on the Vinyl Factory's Twitter feed, actually, and I saw it and thought, what on earth is that thing? And then when I was watching it... Okay, I'm going to get... I'm grumpy old man. It did have an element of the king's new clothes about it, and I was sort of thinking, okay, it's interesting, but what what is it that it really does, I suppose? Um, so, I don't know. I mean, what what does it do that I, that I can't do on an iPad, I suppose I wanted to know? And uh, it's a mechanical device, yes, so... Uh, I wanted to be grumpy about it. That's why I brought ah. it to the panel. <laughs> okay. So what, what was it? That, I mean, I like the idea. Uh, I must admit, the idea of it sounded great, but I just think, you know, it'd be nice to hear something that was a little more um, musically relevant uh, or musically demonstrating, you know, the possibilities there. But, uh, uh, and you know, because essentially it's just like a bit like... Um, Loops. Well, not even a loop. It's like an organ that, you know, um, what do they call those? You know, it's like a music box. Sim very simple monophonic music box, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to know how it translates colour into tone because, um, I mean, if there's if it's if it does translate real, you know, minuscule variations of colour into tone, then perhaps it could get interesting because it could then become very microtonal. And I've, I don't know, I'm I've developed an interest in that again, microtonality, and people playing real drum kits that's suddenly appealing to me again. So. <laughs> Well, maybe, uh -huh. maybe the maybe the topic of this, rather than commenting on the specific technology, is the kind of concept that the linkage is between colour and sound. Because I know that you you find that that happens. I mean, are there specific instances yeah. where colour, yeah. specific colours relate to kind of sounds or notes, or how does that kind of work? Well, um, for me, it's sort of I don't really get any any rainbows of colours or anything as interesting as that unfortunately i'd love it if i did actually i don't think i'd be phased by it or anything i think it'd find it interesting um what happens for me is if i hear loud sound you know like when you get hit on the head really <laughs> really hard you see stars and that's only ever really happened to me once when i fell off a motorbike i really clouded my head hard and got up and there were stars everywhere i get that so if, if if Andy Taylor, his guitar stack is just insanely loud, and I w had the misfortune of walking in front of it when he decided he was going to like hit a, an A bar chord one day, and it was like, <laughs> and I get this kind of a, a, a sparkles all up the back of my neck, and then everything goes gold, which is kind of weird, but mm. only with very very loud sounds. So something must be. You know, the compressor must go off over a certain level. And, maybe and, so. Maybe and, you've got a loose uh, nerve you know, somewhere that get, just gets jolted. Um, Rich, I'm guessing uh, by your by your, co ch your your comments in the chat room that synesthesia is not necessarily something that you find uh, relates to your musical um, experiences, right? I just couldn't believe I was looking at this toy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, all of the reasons why Mark was skeptical and which I suppose motivated his submitting this thing uh, were true for me exponentially as well. 
Okay, well, maybe the best thing to do then is to move on to something else, unless anybody's got a very strong thing to say uh, about it um, or about the idea of colour and sound generally. Um, The only positive thing I can say about it is it might be interesting trying to work out the puzzle. So trying to work out how to make... I mean, if the segments are all different sizes, so trying to work out how to get the right number of segments around it. But if it if the segments relate to... It's got to relate to triplets and... What are those little ones called? Dotted. Quattered. Quattered. <laughs> quavers. those. I mean, if you have to work out how to fit those on, then it could become a very interesting puzzle. But, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. He was the famous music composer uh, who had synesthesia and could really and then is, was it is Schoenberg it Ma- Schoenberg um, Schoenberg several maybe of them did actually several uh one of them really tried to sort of document it didn't he and he kind of worked out what his you know which frequencies or which notes made him think of certain colors but it is quite interesting to me because when i work in the studio and I'm using I always color my tracks I always have to be looking at colors and I've kind of chosen colors over the years now which have sort of I keep I keep fine-tuning I'm a bit nerdy with it and go into the kind of properties and I fine-tune the colors so the colors so when I'm working on my projects you know it makes sense I can navigate it but I'm trying to sort of make the colors make sense to the the sounds that I'm playing. ah you don't have it what colors the chorus Oh no 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 no! no. It's you have, um, just in, just instruments. Ah. But, um, do you have like a cross wiring of uh, kinesthesia as well, like feeling? So do because I feel music, and I oh. will listen to something, and then I'll get like this kind of feeling running through my body, and then in my gut and everything, and I kind of go, oh no, that one feels right, and everyone goes, well, how did it sound? I go, oh, I don't know, I was feeling it, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind think... of a weird thing to do if you're a sound engineer, and I. Oh, you've got to feel. Yeah, on that, but. you've got to feel music. I think I completely hundred percent with you there. You know the the you know the the feeling in your body. Mm. It's uh, it's essential. Um, but I I think I might have told this story before. Apologies if I have. But just about the feel of music. There's a great technique um, about j- how to feel what's a good take by. Maybe you've got a couple of takes which are almost the same but slightly different for whatever reason. And then to feel the take is to shake like a big... Well, I've done it like shaking cushions off settees and getting all the band to shake them in time. And the track that feels nicest to shake to, <laughs> that's what you go with. And it's a really interesting way of making you kind of feel the music because as you're shaking this big heavy thing and you're concentrating on shaking that as you listen to the music, it's a... It's an interesting way of translating the feel like into what you actually... Because it's difficult, isn't it, to make a, an assessment between music without an emotional yeah, response. Yeah. Anyway, I suppose that's sorry, a, I'm No, side, that's an I, interesting point. I don't know. Um, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, Rich, I mean, there must be times uh, in when you're recording or when there's a lot of takes going down, do, uh, it, does there ever a point, you know, which is it A or B, or is it very, very clear which is going to be used every time? I try not if we're taking takes or recording in a loop i try not to make those judgments while it's going down i will unavoidably form some impressions that i try not to become too attached to while it's going down but i prefer the opportunity to review it ah so rather than sort of tick or star each time it goes around which is what i've traditionally done making notes as you go you think that's probably detrimental to actually prop because you can only relate to what's been rather than what's going to come, I suppose, can't you? It distracts me from the musical, from determining whether it's the right thing musically. In other words, right. judging the performance is one area and judging whether or not this part is the right thing is another area. Sure. And usually they're going on simultaneously and I can figure out the bit about the performance later or if need be, make it. But <laughs> but um, the part about whether or not it's what belongs there is the part I'm usually focused on while it's going down. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, the next topic then, perhaps, so we sort of go for the, this was the, uh, another one, was the interesting idea of this bionic ear, which came up in the... Uh, I, was, I was hoping to talk with uh, Carl about this because it's kind of got quite a, a, a bizarre concept. This is the... Um, 
uh, bionic ear with superhuman potential. In fact, I think I've got a picture of it being made, if you're interested. This is a 3D printer, which happened to be in the press at the moment in big ways. Um, seems like a much more um, humanistic thing to be making out of a 3D printer than, than what's currently in the news. An ear. I like the idea of that. So anyway, the idea of this is they've basically built a, a, a bionic ear. Um, Princeton University, they're high-functioning bionic ears made on a mix of cellular material, silicone electronics, and printed them using a thousand bucks 3D printer. And it gives ridiculously high ranges of audio uh, capabilities. And the idea is that, you know, perhaps in the future, you know, if, for instance, you needed your ears replacing, which I, I'm not sure what kind of accident you'd have to have for that to happen, but uh, let's not dwell on that. But, I mean, would... You'd have to have a bit of a Van Gogh moment, wouldn't you? <laughs> Yeah, perhaps so. Um, but d uh, bionic ears, an interesting concept. I mean, would you, uh, d if you, if your ears could hear so much more, would, do you think it would make the mixing process any better? Or would it make too much information? It'd be kind of, it's an interesting concept in terms of what it might do. Li like li Almost like li seeing through another person's eyes, because obviously we all have different, uh, we're used to our relationships with our ears. That's our primary thing. It must be very hard to, to relearn that whole thing. I guess the mixes would only make sense to people who listened with bionic ears. Well, perhaps so. Uh, you, uh, do you think you'd just be kind of fixated on the on the lack of quality? <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> because you'd just be hearing these flaws all the time because, you know, you were so tuned in. I think you would have to repair the human perception model first, actually, because we are so dumb as human beings that as I'm watching, say, Rich here, and he moves around, he's doing this at 25 frames per second. But to me, it looks like a seamless experience, like the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like the whole thing's just this smooth kind of thing, right? So, I mean, our hearing must work in the same way. We must be, it must be broken down into a number of frames. And I know MP3s do that, and that's why sometimes they're able to stretch time stretch things that they're not meant to be time stretching and so on um so i think we'd need to fix that first because i think we're probably we think we're hearing the same thing when we listen to an mp3 or an, a high quality wav file and the reality is that we're not hearing the same thing and even with the wav file it's a whole load of square waves isn't it it's forty-four thousand one hundred square waves per second so it's going past going <laughs> So if you've got your bionic ear and you can suddenly hear that, you know, above the Nyquist frequency, you can suddenly hear the sampling frequency. Oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah it would that would all be get unpleasant. very unpleasant. We, it's such a lot of nasty stuff tucked up mm. up there. Absolutely. Yeah, I think bionic ear. I, all, all I remember about um, but people with bionic powers, you know, like superheroes, is they all seem troubled because they're constantly being kind of, in, their, their perceptions being interfered with at, at a sort of outside of the human scale of things and it's just constantly troubling and i think it would be something that you'd end up with if you had bionic ears as well perhaps do, 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 do. yeah you'd have, <laughs> It'd be a, like... you'd have to have a ladder filter <laughs> built in there wouldn't you like a nice ladder filter and a big a big frequency and res knob so you could just talk, just tune, tune that it out in. yeah just <laughs> shut down the top end that would be interesting sorry oh, i was distracted. on your ipad via bluetooth though wouldn't it probably yeah interesting idea well you could probably um I, I'm sure it will happen. I mean, it's bound to. That, I, mean, just cause oh, I, I, I hope they make it look a bit nicer than that thing with funny weird coil inside it because that, that's not going to be very is, um, pleasant to whisper sweet nothings into, is it? It'll be a bit sort of distracting. <laughs> I mean, I think how we think that people will perceive if they had something like that wired into their brain would be a completely different experience, but perhaps just as useful as having a human ear. Because mm. let's face it, our ears weren't necessarily designed for listening to music. They're so that we can hear uh, large bears coming up behind us to, who, who want to eat us, aren't they? And I like suppose so, yeah. So, I suppose that's true. Um, if it serves that function, then it's probably, you know... It'll do. Can I, can I tell you a little... Sorry, can I totally change the subject just for a moment? Yeah, and just why tell not? You a little, um, this thing now, this teenage ah. engineer, OP1, I've used it for a week, and I've had some really bizarre experiences with it and i just wanted to just sort of just tell you quite a funny story that happened with it the other day um i'd gone up to visit my parents in north wales and it was like six hour train journeys either way so i thought brilliant i'm gonna try and use this thing because you i uh, this you know i think people everyone knows what it is these days but one of the things and the reason i kind of got it is it's got a virtual tape machine like a six yeah. minute 
sort of real to real. You can kind of record and, and cut and paste. Sure, and you, but you can record using the mic and the line into it as well. So the actual. Oh, you just lost your mic. <laughs> it was, the, it no, was no, at the sorry. word mic that <laughs> it all went. It went horribly no, wrong. A, actually, there's a button on this microphone. If I press the button, look what happens. I, I talk, I, it goes like this. <laughs> if I press the button. <laughs> Which isn't particularly useful. It's just, uh, this is the voice live. And it's, ah, uh, yeah, okay. blah, blah. Anyway, sorry. This thing, it's got a six minute tape recorder. And then there's also like a vinyl, like a little record deck on it. Yeah, and then six it, minutes per side. Six minutes per side. And you sort of save your, so anyway. I'd sort of, uh, on the train journey home, I managed to fill the whole six minutes and I thought, okay, I'll render an album. So I rendered the, the album I, and it does it in real time. So you can kind of twiddle it as it goes down onto the album. And then uh, when I got home, I played it to my to my partner and, uh, and she was like, wow, you know, because it is an astonishing thing. You make really It mad. does sound good. Yeah, I was revisiting the review I did um, just over the weekend and I was re remarking on that. But, but what I was going to say there, what happened when I was on the train, because I managed to fill six minutes of the tape, th there's like no file system in there at all. So you've just got like six minutes of tape and you can't save nothing. It's really peculiar. They've kind of made this decision to just, there's no undo features on the thing either. They've, they've kind of cut all these things away. But it's kind of interesting because it forces you into working in particular ways. But the, the, it's like a hardcore machine in a way. And I felt the wrath of it then because... Instead of pressing play on the record, on the album, I pressed record. Oh, I realized my mistake and pressed stop straight away. But it wiped the whole thing, just gone. Oh. No, oh, no. With just one, you know, and the buttons were kind of almost the same. It was next door to each other. And you, you know. could not do it. Oh. No, gone. Just by pressing record. and Because as soon as you start recording on the, the album, that's it. It just kind of replaces what's on there. But I just cleared the tape, so I'd wiped it all first and then oh started no! working on Yeah. I oh killed no. Yeah. And I thought, oh no, this is like like the, the nastiest feature on this device, wow. you know, because I had this amazing experience doing this tune. And then you ruined it all. Yeah, with can the you, um, can you not contact them? After uh, data recovery or something. Are what you sure? Been, I think well, that apparently, but this this is the thing. This is built in as a design choice, though, to make it like a hardcore machine. Now that yeah. feels like a design choice too far, but um, but but uh. you know because you kind of appreciate that design choice in other ways. You know that you can't undo as soon as you press record. You you know that's it because almost like if you're recording to tape, as soon as you've pressed record, that's it. You know, yeah, but you can but, stop, and the rest of everything that came after that on the timeline would still be there, wouldn't it? That's that, and that, that does whole thing to add. Wow, it, they should add it. They should add yeah. it. Well, there is uh, actually an undo when you're recording a short period because you can cut. You could you press the lift button and it takes it out and then into the clipboard. So you sort of do, sort of. Yeah, but I mean, it's only that function. Well, uh, what can I album, say? Uh, the album bit itself. The album. Back bit up itself. your recordings, young man. Yeah, but the idea was I was doing this all on the train. So I was cleared. I'd finished, I'd filled the six minutes of tape, put it across onto the side A. So in order to then make side B, I had to wipe the tape. So I wiped the tape. So yeah. then I started working on side B, then went to play side A and oh, ended up wiping it. Mistake. It's just pressing just, but just the one button, gone. <laughs> it's like, whoa. But it's really strange because I'd been having this, you know, this thing is like a trippy machine. And when you play with it, it's bonkers. I mean, you know, Jean-Michel Jarre put it in his top 10 synths of all time. And when you play with it, you kind of think it is. It really is amazing. You know, it's an amazing thing. So it's a really strange experience then to lose it all as well. Because you think, oh, oh. You know. See, this yeah. happened to me once with an Ensonic VFX SD. I, I had all these different songs on all these different colored floppy disks. And then I copied them all off and put them on this one green floppy disk. Then I erased all the other ones. And I'd got all my eggs in one basket. Something happened to the disk. And I had this amazing kind of like, that was the best thing I ever did, the best music I ever wrote. And then many years later, I bumped into this bass player called Robert, who said, oh, I've got this cassette of that thing that we did. And it just happened to have some of those backing tracks on it. And it wasn't very good. <laughs> but I had this kind of like, oh, no, it was so good. I can't believe I lost that. So, 
invested. <laughs> well, we we've all been there. I I, I can't imagine um, it would be much fun doing it. Well, now you know, Gaz. Anyway, I mean, you've been burnt by the, you've been stung by the OP one. Yeah, but I like it as well. I like it. You feel I chastised. Like you like the, you like the tough I love. I like it because it's burnt. You know, because I've got so sucked into that computer way of doing things. It's just kind of quite nice just to feel like you're out sort of in the danger danger zone again. I don't know. It's kind of weird. But I'm thinking, okay, I've learned from that mistake. You know, you've got to treat this thing like with kind of, ooh, I don't know. A that makes respect. it more fun. It's a bizarre thing. Yeah. It is. When you play around with it, it's bizarre. The Dr. Wave synth engine on it is an incredible. It's incredible. It really kind of makes me go, wow, you know. So I'm sorry. I, I'm, so how were you know, your fellow pas- of- how were your fellow passengers while you were sort of uh, <laughs> scatting all the way from North Wales? No, I was sampling them. I was sampling them, <laughs> I, but but just in the sort, of, but only just using it. It's like you know, going for the TV mania fans and doing all the kind of mania Wales. <laughs> 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 um, I, but it, no, it wasn't any. It was Bank Holiday weekend, and there was no fighting. I wanted to sample some fighting on the train. I thought that would. Have you been need to be on the uh, Plymouth. I should train have. I, I should have started it. I should have started it. Um, oh, uh, sorry. Um, the, the the teenager. I, I blame the OP one. It's kind of. Um, it's very good fun. You can subvert your surroundings. You know quite considerably <laughs> well I, I must admit when i went look look, look back and uh yesterday i was having a listen to it and I thought, oh yeah that sounded pretty good actually and it was a nice little thing it's just you know it is a lot of money what is it you know it's not not a cheap item it's still no, a, what, it's a thousand expensive. thousand bucks or something isn't it yeah thousand quid it's quite an expensive thing but it probably as you had no it probably wouldn't blend it's yeah. made from cnc <laughs> um <laughs> aluminium so i imagine so, you'd need yeah. a pretty serious blender to uh, to blend it um, um, oh, actually, one thing I wanted to ask, Rich, because we talked about um, the Russ Hughes uh, method of bringing AU uh, plugins into Pro Tools, and you said you were going to check it out, and we spoke about it last week, and I wanted to try and make time this week just to see whether you'd had the opportunity to, to check that out yourself. Using... Yes, I did. Ah, and how did you find it? Did it, did it perform adequately? It did. Here it did. Uh, with the HD system, I found it impossible at least so far, to aggregate the HD interface with anything, including Soundflower, which is required. You have to uh, yeah. uh, aggregate your interface with Soundflower in order to bring it about. I wasn't able to do that with the HD interface, but I was able to do it here with my <laughs> my lovely Track 16 Motu and uh, got it working and had plugins hosted both in main stage like he did and in Ableton like he didn't. Um, and successfully was able to run AUs and VSTs through the Pro Tools if I wanted to. But I sure do hope I don't have to do that <laughs> when it comes to AAX time. Yeah. How was your latency? Did it sort all that out? Yeah, it was pretty quick. It was actually really right. impressive. It was pretty much, I mean, it didn't feel substantially worse than the 256 sample buffer I'm using. When it um, does it, does it, uh, does it, do you still get latency compensation or do you have to work all that out and move things around a little bit? Didn't go that deep into it. Just got oh, yeah. it playing, felt the response time between the, the actual physical keyboard and the, and the, and the plugin uh, being hosted in the other program, saw the input to the host program, verified that's what I was listening to. And that's about as far as I got. All right. Okay. Excellent. On that well, subject, can well, I just say to all our people, thank you very much. I've had so many emails supporting. I think somebody put a post on the Digi Users Group or whatever his website, and then Russ Hughes did something on the on his what's it called Pro Tools fan website. I can't remember. Pro Tools what it expert. Is. Thank you, Pro Tools expert. And I've literally just had an email about an hour ago saying wanted to tell you maximum respect for the AAX statement linked through to there. Wish more developers had the balls. Thumbs up. Looking forward to the new products you make instead of constantly porting. Customer and a fan. And I wrote back to him just before the show started. And he came back saying, Dave Spears himself, I know your voice from the Sonic Talk podcast. <laughs> so, Marty Rudinek, thank you very much. Made my week. Only one hate mail versus about... I don't know, 30 or 40 pro comments. And a lot of people saying, if they had one wish, 
over the next couple of years, it will be no more major OS re revisions. And there's a link for you. There's a segue for you. And no more massive updates. More a case of fixing what's out there, allowing people to be creative instead of constantly playing catch up. So there you go. It's very interesting that you bring that up. Um, there, I mean, we do have other uh, a, a, a topic about that, but the, the, that's an interesting idea, really. Rather than, uh, but I think we are the like I say, content creators, people who actually have to work within this kind of environment are um, much more susceptible to these changes than you know people who just use the interwebs and, and, and Word and what have you. So, But yes, yeah. th we might have a look at this. 10.9 rumours. I think I've got a link here. Let me just... Uh, I didn't bring it out because I, I wasn't sure how long or far we get Carl with uh, for, for Carl. But uh, if I look to 10.9, yes, this is the... Uh, I, I like the fact that it is... It, um, this is according to uh, The Verge, who are quite a good, um, generally, you know, good quality um, reportage output. Uh, according to this 9 to 5 Max, who has a track record of few data, uh, basically, uh, there's a, some rumours that will provide details of what may be included in 10.9, which is going to be uh, announced at, 10, uh, at WWDC in June. Um, apparently, it's internally codenamed Cabernet. Do you think we're going to start moving to wines rather than big cats? I'm quite. I'm in favour of that. I just bought a big a bottle of wine called Fat Bastard. Yeah, I think I've seen that's that's <laughs> that would um, make a really good operating system, wouldn't it? Bloated <laughs> bastard. Yes, I think you're probably right. Uh, uh, I, uh, very bloated. Uh, so uh, anyway, what he's saying is that a uh, new multitasking feature inspired by the mobile operating system may included and background apps may be paused similarly to how they are on the iPhone, uh, which means that you're going to obviously get more use. Well, it's going to free up the process, which I'm not sure how useful that is in the kind of massively yeah. powered 12 core i7 or whatever we've got, whether that's necessary. But it, it's... It Isn't just sounds a like a whole like, load of work, surely. It sounds like it's gone back to like the way we used to do multitasking on an Atari bloody Mega ST, isn't it? <laughs> that used to pause apps in the background. I'm sure it did. <laughs> but it's an interesting point you raise, um, and I don't know what you think about that, um, Rich, because I know you you kind of you tend to sort of try out the new stuff and you know and, and sort of look ahead to what's coming to make sure that you know when you upgrade it. Will it work and will it work on the, the system? I mean, would it, it would be kind of nice to kind of go, let's just stop there and, and just take things forward in terms of uh, non-OS upgrades. Wouldn't that be nice? Or do you do know. that? I don't know if it would be nice, but it doesn't matter if it would be nice. <laughs> because there is no money in it. Well, that's true. It's a bit like making and a And as long as there's no money in it, that's not what they're going to do. Yeah, which is a fair point, but don't you get the feeling that sometimes this is all about, you know, producing the right product in the right quarter so that the share price hits, as opposed to actually creative endeavours? But yes, I do agree yes. with that. It's not Absolutely. mutually exclusive. It doesn't prevent us from being creative, either with those tools or with the old tools. I, I know a guy uh, who Niall's writing with right now, who's a Swedish DJ producer guy who's very famous and is 23 years old, and he does all his work and a laptop on Fruity Loops, you know, and it's that's what he wants to do. And he's brilliant at it. He's really, he's got the thing down. And first guy I ever met using Fruity Loops was Mark Tinley. So, um, you know, uh, I, I don't know. It's not going to have, they're not going to stop producing operating systems because it, it sells gear. And that's what, how they make their money. And um, people aren't going to stop writing revs to match those operating systems because their business is selling software to write it, to run on these platforms. So I, I just don't mean to be a wet rag or, you know. No, I understand what you're saying, but do you think. But I'm a practical man. It's not going to happen. Do you think the model could change that? I mean, Dave, you're a software developer. I mean, would it not make more sense to kind of go, well, look, you could just, you buy into revisions. So, you know, we'll keep making things better and, and, and new instruments or, or iterations or updates. And, you know, you buy a license for now or you could buy a license that entitles you to future upgrades. Because, I mean, you've been the, you have been the sort of uh, the victim or everybody really, and certainly in the audio plugin world, has been the victim of just kind of constant porting and, and changes and what have you. So, I mean, you end up, you know, wasting all that development time on stuff that really is, you know, not going to make anything creative come out of it, right? Yeah, and I think that in a lot of aspects, it's had uh, it's played a part in a lot of this movement towards hardware. I mean, I agree with Rich in a lot of ways that there are always people, particularly the kind of young guns who haven't got 
finances and they will always find ways of exploring software and software for me is an incredibly brilliantly and ethical um business to be in we're not dealing with landfill and all that kind of nonsense that goes with that so and so and, and in some cases you know perhaps i've been a little bit scathing because i am a, a kind of hardware fan but i do think this kind of endless perpetual cycle is like a relentless psychopath which is actually mirroring what a corporation is seen to be by an awful lot of people. So I think that some people just get to the point where they go, you know what, actually, I don't want that anymore. I don't want that uh, side of things. And the, the producer that I was talking to who voiced this opinion is in a situation where they're trying to archive all of their work, and it's not a million miles away from uh, connections here, um, they're trying to archive their work so that when a TV station or something comes and they have to, they can apply, you know, a sink, they can easily access all that stuff. But that means going back right back to the Atari days and making sure this is. Our, and he said it's just such an epic task, staying on top of things, that it almost becomes non-cost effective unless they do this, unless they continually keep this archive up. And of course, all of that gets in the way of the creativity. And this is what I find yeah, absolutely. from people. A lot of people are actually turning around and going, you know what, actually you can keep all of this ever-upgradable software that's got to be, you know, because an OS and a host has been updated or a completely new format has appeared, and I'll just stick with a couple of really old analog synths that I know I can get repaired if they break down. And I think there's an element of that right across the board now. You know what really annoys me, and I'm going to little... I'm not going to rant too much. I'll just rant a little bit. That is, you go and buy a piece of software which you think is going to have future proof ability, proof, provability to it, right? So I bought Contact thinking, oh, okay, so I can just buy sound libraries for this piece of software, and as I go on, I won't need to upgrade anything because I'll just buy whatever sound library. Suddenly, right, why is it that Contact, uh, Native Instruments sent me this thing saying, we're going to give you a free sound library. It was Abbey Road drummer instead of abbey road drums so i'd got some abbey road drums and they sent me the drummer so this is like people playing the beats and i thought brilliant that's you know fab because i can't play the bloody drums so i thought you know i'll put put that in and it said you can't load it onto this uh snow leopard 10.6.8 you have to have the latest version of the contact plugin to use this abbey road drummer um and then so I up, so to upload to upgrade contact I had to upgrade Snow Leopard and then all of my Pro Tools broke and blah 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 <laughs> blah 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 blah. But you so you get these kind of like these free offers. But the, why? I mean, I'm sure there's absolutely no reason why it, it needed to work on the next release of the plugin. Why you know why well, did they have to break it for yeah, me? So it forced me to yes, upgrade. But that's the point, isn't it? I think that's the whole kind of. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's it's free, but it's a loss leader because I had to buy so much stuff just to get it to work. You know what I, I think? A, I think I what developers say to me years ago. No one makes money on version one software. Everybody looks to for other people to buy in, and then the update is where you make the money, and the next, and the next, and the next. And right. for something to become that cynical, which actually this is a kind of fresh and exciting business and always was for us, for that to have now morphed into something that cynical, I find slightly disturbing. Well, I think the other thing is what, what we need is a really – is to is for somebody to kind of take and this is what i've been doing recently so ever since the operate all the drives and everything went down the drive went down in this machine that i've just now created a, a a drive box that has just got snapshots of all the machines in the states they are now working so whatever i do i can always go back to that and sort it out and that that kind of is the answer isn't it to a degree you just need i mean obviously when operating systems change and the processor will no longer run the operating system then you're screwed but to have something that will actually just you can just go click that's the snapshot that goes and you know what the hell you know if you've got a big album project then back up the entire thing at the same time so you go here's all the multis and here's probably an even smaller disc with a snapshot operating. of the entire operating system going yeah. on isn't it yeah. I mean, I, I've got so many songs advice. in Logic that I load up, and I load the song up, and all the plugins are crossed out, and I'm thinking, but I've still got that EQ product, and, and I've still got that Match EQ, and I'm thinking this and that, and I've still got all those plugins. 
why won't they load? Just the standard Logic plugins won't load because they've changed them all to like some newer version. Ah, well, that's all the older versions of Logic are now no longer compatible. So I don't even know what the I don't know what my EQ settings were on those tracks, unless I bounced <laughs> them out of stems. So. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like Rich is playing the uh, play playing the uh, backup blues there, the OS plugins blues. <laughs> I can see him. Gaz wanted to say something, and I cut <laughs> him off. Actually, go, Gaz. Oh, no, no, no! Lost ah, the thread. it's gone. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I mean, to be honest, I know I was ranting about that OP one, and I'm sorry. You know, it's kind of it's been, it's uh, but partly that whole. Just getting away from a computer, but being able to sort of make meaningful sort of music um, portably. And uh, I suppose with the iPad, you know, the iPad, that's what they're trying to do, isn't it? You know, with an OS, with this uh, new, this whole idea of the background apps, just so that operationally so similar, the iPad, the iPhone, OS X, they get, they, they're trying to merge the similarity of that way of working and um it doesn't work because one is a consumption and one you know more of a consumption device I, than a creation. But in a way though i was going to say you know maybe we are at this kind of transition period and one thing that's quite nice that i think most people will find with ios devices you know the apps you just touch them and they work you know and you're not messing around installing things and updates yeah. come out and then they just fixed you know so in some ways, there is an evolution of the older way of doing things. And, like, perhaps this is quite a good thing as it's a transition. I mean, obviously, it's not for people who are making software, and I apologize for that. But in terms of maybe it is just this evolution, and we have to do it. Well, it interesting. I, I'd just like to point us at the chat room, actually. There's been some good comments in here. Omnipulse said uh, the industry should just make an audio OS, OS on, built onto Linux and then just... You know, you you got control of that. Um, let me see. I'm trying to find him now. Uh, I think somebody does do that, though, don't they? Well, there sort of, but it's not it, it's not widely <laughs> adopted. Um, no, it's sort of like somebody's just gathered up all of the good audio programs on Linux, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Which were, uh, under Ubuntu, and you can buy it on eBay. Someone sells like a drive, and you just put the drive in your machine, yeah. boot off it, and off you go, and you can make. I'm awful. I think there's. That's I think there's. Some, I think there's something in that. I think actually Amazing that's idea. not a bad idea, really, because then you can just keep it away. You know, it's. And it would be nice to separate all of the internet to make my computer stop being. Able, and it's almost like an addiction, isn't it? Like, you sit there, you start tinkering away, you like start playing something on a keyboard, and it goes boom up in the corner. It says, "Oh, you've got an appointment." At, I don't know, whatever, to talk to this person or bing, your email or dong, Twitter or bing, all these things come up and they're all distractions. Yeah. So if you, if, and I'm, I'm not willing to take it off the computer, but maybe somebody needs to bring an operating system out. Do your boot. Absolutely deletes and, you know, stops me from doing it because yeah. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> well, yeah. that's, yeah. that's a problem, I suppose. No, uh, I am. I am. It, it's. Uh, I think. Um, obviously, this is a, it's a fairly philosophical and uh, um, conversation. But yeah, there are issues to be had there. I mean, I, I, I'm guessing Rich doesn't do that in his day job. You know, he's not got kind of Facebook notifications coming up on his uh, on his machine while while Niall's ripping a track down. Or, you know, it just it just doesn't happen that way. You know, and it's the same. It's it's the same for everything else. You know, that's what your phone's for. You know, and you turn it off at the appropriate moment. Like, um, and um, and that's. See, I didn't do that. I, I Nick. Rhodes used to be going to me, what's that on the screen? And I'd be like sneakily looking at monkey bikes and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. Is that a monkey bike? And I'd be like going, um, uh, and, uh, 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 um, uh. So I, I used to get into terrible trouble for doing all of that. <laughs> you bad boy. Well, I it's about, yeah. Sorry, it? <laughs> I think that's the problem though, isn't it? There is a, a, an element of... Uh, attention span and we're all suffering from it you know to a degree because we all there's, there's so many distractions that we can just i mean you know i try and do things here so i'm kind of i'm trying to do one thing and then another thing and then something else comes up and then i go oh yeah i just remember this and oh i was going to check that lighting connection over there and all this kind of stuff but you've got but to and then your eye op your eye operating system every three minutes it's going boom and you go oh what's that oh uh, update and th this goes on all day long i get maybe two or three of them a day oh that's pretty and good. i think and I read it, and it says improves functionality, and I think, well, I'd better have that, I suppose. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it sounds like it ought to do something new. 
And, and then just... very, very occasionally you get something that sounds, oh, I've got to have that. And then you yeah. end up spending three hours fiddling around with that. And oh. uh, Quentin anyway. Tarantino apparently uh, confiscates all cell phones for the entire crew. Very good plan. Well, that's a di- yeah. I guess that's a different thing because that could ruin a take and that's a kind of lot of money when that's all happening. Um, yeah. I haven't actually been at a production rehearsal recently. You know, in the time when smartphones have become more prominent, I know, what ha- what happens at what happens at rehearsals for 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 your lot, Gaz? When the when you know you got the crew that you got a lot of stuff going on, you do not want phones happening. Is it phones off and um, you know, like leave your shoes at the door kind of thing? No, not at all. I mean, it's uh, this constant high. It's constant. Yeah, I mean, everyone's kind of busy. All sorts of stuff's going on all the time. So, so that's kind of part of it, I guess. Um, you know, we don't when the songs when we're playing the songs, but it's it's very relaxed. It's very yeah. relaxed. So these things, you know, in some ways, yeah, but in other ways, it's kind of pretty cool as well. I mean, Angie was getting a new flat, so she was checking out that, and she was, you know, and we were all kind of in on checking and flats for her and stuff, you yeah. know. So stuff happens. It's all pretty cool. It's all. I I I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if if you if you've got like a kind of good work ethic in the room yeah i, I think, suppose so i Just think it's quite nice because we pro- were we were there for months you know yeah. so uh so you don't you know you're not living in in complete isolation but it, it was cool it was cool um that um I, I don't know that it's sometimes necessary to bring a load of like stressful s- situation into the room you know, well, like, sure, yeah. If it's like know. I'm breaking up with my girlfriend, I need to be on the phone at the moment. That's not really the thing to bring to <laughs> no, a rehearsal, is it? But you oh, know, no. but yeah. No. Just I, remind you. Just reminded me that I've got a friend who lives in New York, and she lives uh, on a street where she's got this kind of beautiful doorstep outside of her flat. So when she's sitting in or apartment, is that the right word for America? So she's in her apartment with the windows open in the summer, and people come down the road and they sit on the. Is it called the stoop in America? So they sit on there and they have very loud mobile phone conversations and then they wander off down the street. So she's forever looking out the window going like, what What are you doing? Go away. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but I investigated this thing called a jammer, which is like this uh, kind of device that blocks mobile phone signals. So she could potentially put that just inside her front door. And as the people walked past her house a mobile phone would die and then she you know nobody would be able to do that mm. so theoretically you could do that on maybe you know big film companies should invest in this and just wipe out all mobile phone signals from the you <laughs> yeah. know from the, and while the they're at it they can put those stage. signals that are supposedly only affect ch- um, teenagers under a certain age yeah Oh God, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's not go there. It's, it sounds yeah. like it's the end. I've just had a, a very nice email from Carl Hyde who said uh, he'd be happy to do it again with a getting a, and get a proper camera out. So uh, be, maybe we'll get the opportunity to talk to him again. Um, so th- uh, thanks to everybody for hanging in there. I, I know um, um, there was perhaps not as much FaceTime as we normally have together, um, but I really appreciate you joining us this week. And I will say thank you very much, Gaz, for joining us. I, am I seeing you tomorrow? I don't know, but perhaps that's another conversation. Yep. Okay, um, so Gaz Williams, uh, songsurgeon.co.uk, at Gaz Gold Star, if you're following on Twitter, see what he's up to. Thanks very much for following us. Also, we'll say thank you to Mark Tinley, who's over there um, in profile. Uh, likebeing.com, also uh, the TV Mania project. Don't forget. Um, yeah, I've got distracted now. I'm looking up mobile it. phone jammers on eBay. I'm thinking <laughs> I need to buy one of those, and then maybe I can jam How'd myself, you know? and then I won't be able to do anything I'm not meant to be doing. And <laughs> <laughs> just turn the Wi-Fi off, maybe. But uh, uh, yeah, I can't though. I just, you know, something might happen in the world that I wouldn't need to know about. That's true. Uh, in fact, like Dave that is bear d- that ate those monkeys earlier on. I mean, oh, that's terrible. Man. Did you see that? No, I haven't. I've been doing a show, uh, Mark. But, uh, Rich Hilton, thank you also very much for joining us and hanging in there. I know um, you. Oh, that's good. getting a bit of getting a bit of blues in there. Uh, I hope you've got a good day. In fact, um, are you were you involved? I didn't ask actually. Were you involved in the Daft Punk collaborational aspect anyway, or was it just Mister Mister Rogers who went along to that? It was just Niall who went to that. And if you're interested, actually, uh, listeners generally, there's a really interesting series called the uh, I've forgotten what it's exactly called. I posted a news item on it yesterday because there was an interview with Giorgio Moroder, and it's a series of interviews about the people that. Daft Punk have collaborated with and it's not so much about the Daft Punk project but about their kind of musical contribution 
and them as uh, the collaborators. That's right. And it's it's really interesting. And Niall Rogers does a good one. There's some fantastic bits of him just playing the guitar as well. And uh, yeah, well worth watching. Very, very interesting mm-hmm. and a great piece of PR for uh, it's on the Daft Punk site. As uh, um, Feld Muso says in the chat room, the collaborators, it's called. That Get Lucky single's best number one in ages. It's amazing. It's a cracker, Absolutely isn't it? Absolutely amazing. I really are. Uh, and the new video with the three-headed Peter Serenovich or something. Have you seen that video? No, the video I for it. It's amazing. It's a brilliant song. And it's great to hear Niles on the number one single in Britain. You know, fantastic. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. In fact, um, uh, there's uh, there's an interesting piece which we were going to cover this week, didn't get round to, which is just about Daft Punk and how they kind of approach this album to try and make a classic disco record rather than... Um, uh, doing it with uh, you know samples and electronics, just going to all these fantastic places with guys who were around at the time creating these great records that were ordinarily being sampled and just kind of trying to make one just like that. And it sounds like they've largely succeeded in that respect. And also we're going to say um, thank you very much to Dave Spears there, who's obviously checking his Facebook. Um, you are. Uh, oh, I sorry, think... I, I've been listening to the last part of the show. I've been playing Tetris. And ah, upgrading my apps. A wise no, I haven't. That was a complete lie. A, a wise move, sir. But I've worn um, my thumb out with that. Have you been? Uh, have you been checking your birthday wishes on Facebook? Happy birthday! I believe is uh, due fairly tight. Um, it's either is it two days, man? Time? And I'm fifty. And I'll tell you what, I'm Excellent. proud to be fifty because there were times where I've abused myself to the point where I didn't think I was even going to make twenty-nine. Excellent. <laughs> so I'm happy. Well done. And uh, and I. Uh, uh, Chris, your uh, business partner, said, now you've got the dot-com modular, which was in part a 50th birthday present. Are you going to finish the album now? Yeah, I will. I'll tell you what, I've programmed up this great thing. I've got this thing, right, where I I can trigger the sequences from the keyboard now. I've been learning how to do that. So do you want to, you heard my you heard my tune last week. Yeah, I want you? to hear this one. Quite impressive. Should we, uh, should we sign out with this one? Okay. Okay, see you later. Oh, I'll turn the bloody volume down. I ruined it, didn't I? Uh, <laughs> oh, Hold I'll on. Trigger, uh, the... Okay, let's pretend that. Let's that pretend we did that didn't happen. So, Dave. Hang on, I've got to set everything back to zero. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to happen. There we go. <laughs> so, should we go for take two? Let's do take two. Okay, hang on a bit. Make sure I've got the... right. Okay. So, uh, I programmed up the uh, modular, which is obviously my 50th birthday present, and I've done it so that when I press the key, it triggers the sequence. So, I spent all day programming this. So, I think we'll probably sign out with this. I think it's fairly apt, don't you? Yes. Goodbye. What's going on? Ah, oh, <laughs> uh, modular electronics. Hey, you need no, to upgrade it. Hey, go, yeah. <laughs> ah, beautiful. <laughs> we got there, there in the end. Get done by the copyright police now. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Oh, well, I'll just drop it now. I can, I can, I can contact Carl. I'll just say, could you have a word with them? Yeah. But anyway, that was Sonic Talk number two hundred three hundred and twelve. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, also thank you to our sponsors. Don't forget, uh, if you want to download a copy of Iris, which is a fantastic spectral synthesis program. Uh, ten day, ten day, uh, um, free, uh, fully operational demo isotope.com forward slash iris. Once again, thank you very much for listening, everybody.